So now we're going to get into the receptors as well as the somatic sensory pathways. We're going to kind of talk about what's picking up these signals, what's picking up these stimuli, and how do we get it to the central nervous system. Um, and so for this one, we're going to talk about sensory receptors based on location and structure and type. We're going to talk about um, the modalities for somatic sensation. We're going to talk about different types of somatic sensory receptors and the receptor field, right? And then a little bit later, we'll talk about what we're going to get into with the somatic sensory pathways. So let's talk about sensory receptors based on their structure first. And when we're saying structure, um, we're not talking about the unipolar, bipolar, multipolar thing, right? That was like class, that was structural classification of neurons. Here we're focused on one potential or one um, specific location on the neuron, and that's the dendrites. So when we're looking at sensory cells, when we're looking at sensory neurons and receptors, we can classify them based on how the dendrites are structured. And so we can have some that are free nerve endings, some that are encapsulated nerve endings or modified, and then specialized epithelial cells that actually stimulate a sensory neuron. So we're adding like an extra cell in the mix. So here's our first one. This is an unmodified free sensory nerve ending. The dendrites are out in the open. There's nothing encapsulating them, nothing, you know, doing anything to, you know, cover them or anything. It's just out in the open. And, and so we can use these to detect a few different things. We can use them to detect pain. So if they are a nociceptor, they can detect pain. If they're a thermoreceptor, they can detect temperature. Um, remember from the lab that temperature is not an absolute temperature, but a comparison against the background kind of body's temperature. Um, so that means it is a, your, the baseline can be adjusted depending on the body's temperature. And some of these can detect warmer temperatures as the temperature is uh, warmer by comparison, the action potential rate increases, at, or some of them are gonna be for colder temperatures. And if it's a colder temperature um, sensory nerve, then they will detect um, the cold temperatures compared to the body. And as the temperature gets colder in comparison, they'll fire off more action potentials in that setting. Um, they don't necessarily detect both though. Some will go for warm, some will go for cold, as well as things like itch and touch, right? So unmodified free sensory nerve endings, these are just, you know, open free nerve endings. There's nothing that's been modified, nothing's been changed about them. Some sensory nerve endings are modified either because they've been wrapped with epithelial cells or they have layers of connective tissue around them. So in the picture here, we see one that has connective tissue wrapped around it, encapsulating those dendrites, those nerve endings. And so we see these for various um, general senses, including pressure, deep touch, vibration, and stretch. Um, that's the short list of what they can detect. Uh, but we see that there are a lot of these are going to be um, utilized for um, the general senses for touch that, that are associated with touch, like pressure and vibration. And then lastly, we get to the ones that are going to use specialized sensory epithelial cells where we have an epithelial cell that's actually going to do the detecting for us and then is going to communicate with the sensory neuron, usually by releasing a neurotransmitter of some sort that the uh, sensory neuron can pick up on. And so specialized sensory epithelial cells can detect a handful of things like chemicals when we're looking at taste, um, light when we are looking at vision, sound if we're looking at hearing, and gravitational or rotational movement when we are looking at um, equilibrium. We can also classify sensory receptors based on location of the stimulus. So we can be an exteroceptor or an interoceptor. Exteroceptors are gonna detect sensory information from the external environment. So like gustatory cells that we find for use, um, tasting our food or Merkel's discs that detect the pressure and touch from the external environment. 
right? So touch, pain, temperature, proprioception, right? Those things can all be exteroreceptors, whereas interoreceptors or interoceptors are going to detect sensory information coming from the inside. Carotid bodies, right? Carotid bodies being the ones that detect the changes in pH in the blood, for example. Lastly, we can classify sensory receptors based on the type of stimulus. So mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, nociceptors, photoreceptors, chemoreceptors, baroreceptors, osmoreceptors, it's a long list, but we have some, you know, if we look, think about the names, it gives us some information, right? So mechanoreceptors are gonna detect mechanical changes or physical changes, so pressure or vibration um, as examples. Thermoreceptors, as the name implies, are going to be for temperature. Nociceptors detect pain. Photoreceptors detect light. Chemoreceptors will detect chemicals or specific molecules. Baroreceptors will detect pressure, but not in terms of like the same way a mechanoreceptor does. We're talking things like blood pressure, right? So we're looking at a different form of pressure, like an internal form of pressure rather than the mechanoreceptor, which handles like an external pressure being placed on the body. And then Osmoreceptors are going to detect changes in solute concentration or changes in osmolality. And when we look at the somatic sensations, again, this is all based on the sensory receptors we find in skin, muscles, tendons, and joints. And there's four main modalities. There's the tactile ones, which is touch, pressure, vibration, things of that nature. Thermal, which would be temperature, so hot or cold pain, which is we call nociception, and proprioception, which is your body's position or self-movement. So understanding and also making all the little adjustments that are required to maintain things like an upright position. So let's talk about proprioception. Proprioception is using the receptors that we find in joints and the skeletal muscles and tendons and whatnot. And the whole point is to um, help the central nervous system understand what position we're in and if we're moving, what m body parts we're moving if we are. It also helps us maintain muscle tone. So all the little tiny contractions that need to happen to maintain muscle contraction, proprioception helps with that. This is going to consist of free nerve endings and we find that these, um, we find these in the skeletal muscles, we find them in the muscle spindles in these skeletal muscles. This is going to help prevent muscles from overstretching so we don't stretch them too far. And then we also find them in the tendons, in what we call tendon organs, where the tendon and the muscle meet. And this is to prevent um, too much force from being applied to muscles and tendons so we don't cause damage to that junction. Now different body parts have different sensitivities and this comes down to the receptive field. The receptive field is basically the area of skin that is quote covered by a receptor or a neuron and it really depends on the density of receptors in the skin. Usually what we see is when the density of receptors has uh, gone down, so there's fewer receptors spread out over a larger area, the receptive field is large. Right? But as we uh, increase the density of receptors in that region of the skin, right, we become more dense, the receptive fields become smaller for each individual receptor. Right? Think of it like trees, like if you look at a canopy of trees, right, the tops of the trees, if there are very few trees around, that tree can spread out to capitalize on all that light. But if there's a lot of trees around, you may see that each individual tree's top is smaller, right, because they don't want, they can't cover or row underneath the ones nearby. And that leads us to sensory acuity, right? Our ability to basically, basically even think about like how sensitive a site or body part is, basically your ability to tell two, pi two different um, points apart, right? The smaller the receptive field, the greater the tactile acuity, right? The greater the sensory acuity. And again, that's because each, we have with a smaller receptive field, that means we have a higher density of receptors. It allows us to be more um, specific in terms of what, what is touching us. So let's say we're doing like a two-point touch test, right? 
if we're doing a two-point touch test, we want, we'll be able to tell if there are two points if multiple receptors are triggered, right? Multiple receptors would have to be triggered for us to be able to say those are two separate points. That means a smaller receptive field, we can trigger two different receptors at a closer point, right? They can be closer together for us to be able to tell them as two separate points. But if the receptive field is really large, right, we don't have a nice uh, ability to distinguish two points because even though the field is large, it's all triggering the same receptor. And so when we poke at it, right, we have to go, we have to get that second point outside of that large receptive field to trigger the next receptor over, right? So this means, like if you're doing the two point touch um, test, you would have to spread that those calipers apart farther to expand enough so that you're triggering not just one, but two different receptive fields. If it's more sensitive, right, and the receptive fields are smaller, you won't have to expand those calipers as much to trigger two separate receptive fields. All right, we're gonna just roll right into somatic sensory pathways with this same video just for the sake of time because this is relatively short. Um, we're just gonna talk about the, um, the neuron order and kind of where we find those as well as the spinal tracts. Um, and we're gonna break down the names of the spinal tracts so we have a little bit more information and then talk about the somatosensory area in the postcentral gyri. So the somatic sensory pathways, they're carrying information from the somatosensory receptors to the cerebral cortex, the cerebellum, and or the brainstem. And we have a pathway that uses three neurons to get us there. So getting us from the receptor to the brain, right, or to the central nervous system. We're gonna have three neurons. We're gonna start with the neuron that receives the information right from the receptor. That's our first order neuron. So if we're looking at the picture, we see it here, we see it here in red, right? So this is one of the one that is extending from the receptors to the central nervous system. This is our first order neuron, right? We have it here, and then there's another pathway where we see it here, right? We then go, we are going to synapse with the second order neuron. This is going to synapse or, or start at the spinal cord or brainstem level and is going to extend to the thalamus. Right, so we see that in both pictures. Right? Our second order neuron, which is shown in this like blue green, right, is extending from the spinal cord, right, or the um, brainstem. In this case, we're in the brainstem. We're looking at the dorsal column syndrome uh, system. We're going up to the thalamus. Over in the spinal thalamic, we see we are going up the spinal cord through the brainstem to the thalamus. Right, but they both end at the thalamus. From there, we have our third order neuron. This is the last one in the chain. This is going from the thalamus to the primary somatosensory area, which is just behind that central gyrus or that central sulcus um, that divides the parietal from the frontal lobes. Right, so we're going to like the very, the most um, anterior part of the parietal lobe right before we get to the uh, frontal lobe. And so if we look at how we, you know, what are some of the tracts that run through that spinal cord that carry information from the, you know, from whatever is sensing the stimulus to the brain, right? We have a couple different, um, different things. So we have the dorsal column. This is taking us from our arms and legs to the thalamus. This is going to help us with fine touch and vibration and proprioception. The posterior spinocerebellar tract. So the name here, posterior spinocerebellar tract. This is for proprioception, and if we look at the name, it's gonna be in the back side of the spinal cord. It's coming from the spinal cord and extending up to the cerebellum. So this is one that goes to the cerebellum. The lateral spinothalamic tract, right? Lateral spinothalamic tract. Pain and temperature, right? Lateral tells us it's off to the side, Spino from the spine up to the thalamus. The anterior spinocerebellar tract, right towards the front. Spino tells us spinal cord. Cerebellar tells us up to the cerebellum. Again, proprioception. You'll notice that the cerebellar ones go, are involved with proprioception. So you can imagine if you see 
any other one you know that they're handling something else but if you see anything with cerebellar in the name they're going to handle proprioception because that's all about balance and coordination and then lastly the anterior spinothalamic tract is going to deal with coarse touch and pressure and again it's in the front spino from the spine or spinal cord up to the thalamus so spinothalamic tract um, so take a peek at these names and kind of, you know, the names alone kind of tell you what pieces are involved, you know, and where to find them in the spinal cord. And then for the most part, um, the cerebellar ones you should know handle proprioception since the cerebellum is involved with balance. When it comes to processing the somatosensory information, um, most of, you know, all of these somatic sensory impulses and, and some of these special senses um, synapse with sensory neurons in the thalamus and then from the thalamus they will be relayed to the cerebral cortex at what's called the post central gyri right this is the uh, gyrus the the ridge that comes right after the central sulcus and remember that central sulcus is what divides the parietal from the frontal lobes and the, the primary somatosensory area is going to be on the post central gyrus so that means right after right behind the central sulcus right meaning we will be in the parietal lobe and when it comes to looking at how the um, post central gyrus handles everything we see this homunculus um, picture that's drawn out that shows where each body part right where that sensory information is being processed and you see we're kind of following along with the body we starting with the mouth the teeth the gums right moving up through the face the nose the eyes the hands right the fingers the hands the uh, moving up the arm from the wrist to the forearm to the elbow to the upper arm the shoulder head neck trunk and then we make our way down from the hip to the leg to the foot to the toes and very end will be the genitals so we have this nice pattern when it comes to which parts of the um somatosen the primary somatosensory area handle what it is also important to note that we are, when we get the sensory information in, everything is contralateral, meaning we're getting information in, right, from the opposite side, right, from the opposite side. So um, if it's being brought in from like the left foot, it's gonna be handled on the right, 